For the sons of this world are more shrewd, wise, or prudent in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Sons of the world are not like sons of light. And despite their differences, Jesus says today they should be. The sons of this world use the wealth that God has given them, and they are like then the birds of the heavens or the lilies of the field. Now you might squabble that they don't use it correctly. They don't use it for righteous means like caring for the church and in almsgiving, caring for those in need. But the sons of this world don't waste it either. Jesus commends the unjust or unrighteous steward to you because what that steward does is scatters the wealth, the master's wealth, to gain friends and also a home for after when he's fired. It's smart. Everyone knows that you should have a contingency plan if things don't work out with your employer to have an emergency fund. Employees squandering time, money, and assets definitely should have backup plans because they are squandering time, money, and assets. So, does that make this unjust steward a hero or a villain? Does Jesus want you to squander the blessings of the Father? Should you waste your time on unimportant things? Should you abuse your work by borrowing paper and postage, wasting time on social media, or pursuing your own interests on your employer's dime? Should you be storing up the abundance that God grants you for some future rainy day, or should you use it immediately for your needs or for the one in need? There's a confusion. Is Jesus giving you this steward as a hero example? If that's the case, then his instruction to you is that you should be wasting your possessions, squandering them. But something about that doesn't make sense to us. Why does it bother us that the Lord commends this unjust one for wasting possessions? Is this unjust steward a hero or is he a villain? Yes, it is smart for the steward himself, but that doesn't make any sense from a moral perspective. Taking someone else's possessions, that in this case the master, and wasting them, that's always bad. We know that. Unjustly forgiving debtors, illegitimately, to gain them as friends, well, that's also bad, right? So we're looking at the parable from our own vantage point, from our own sense of earthly wisdom, by our own standards of justice, thoughts of stewardship, proper use of time, talents, and treasures, as you've heard, or even a appropriate use of wealth. And since you're hearing this from your own perspective, then, of course, you can't help but read it with a moral sense as for instruction, laws for living, how to be a good Christian, boy or girl. When you read the parable this way, you can't possibly understand the wisdom of what Jesus is saying, his commendation of the unrighteousness, the squandering of possessions, this seeming indifference to the wealth gathering by either the steward or even his master lord. Ultimately, it's nonsensical morality. But what's happening is, if you read it this way, you're not doing theology. You're doing what you might call theologic. Theologic is when you try to make sense and try to fit God into your boxes, your framework, your conceptions of what is good, right, and true. Theology, on the other hand, is theologos. That is the handling of the logos, God's word. It doesn't have to make sense to your reason or your heart. It is real, it's true, it's good, because God has spoken it into reality. So to make sense of the parable, you need to consider it theologically, not according to logic, but according to the logos, according to what Jesus says. 
That is from God's perspective. So don't read it as a lesson about morality or lessons on how to spend money or save or to waste employers' money or even a stewardship sermon, as much as you probably love those. Let's do it, let's do it as theology and read this as if it's a word that describes God himself. It goes like this, by way of anti-type, opposite of the unjust steward, you learn of the type, Christ himself. And that way, Jesus is teaching you to learn how radically different God is than anyone else. And thus how much different the sons of the world are than you, the sons of light. So let's read it that way. Your father, God, entrusted his son, Jesus, with the stewardship of a great house, his heavenly kingdom. It contains rich treasures of forgiveness, abundant mercy, and everlasting life. Those possessions, though, weren't given to the son to be hoarded, protected. Instead, the son died to the Lord of the house, forsaken and humiliated. And then upon the son's death, the great steward Jesus takes the possessions of heaven in his resurrection and gives them away freely, squanders them even, for the poor, the needy, the sick, the unwise. Actually, for you, the unjust. He pours great gifts from that great treasure chest on you who don't deserve it. For this work of Jesus, our Heavenly Father commends him for his wisdom, for his shrewdness. By his dying, rising, and giving the wealth of the Father to those who don't deserve forgiveness, what has Jesus accomplished? He has won friends for the Father to dwell with him in the eternal tabernacles. Indeed, while from your perspective you owe God outstanding debts, and from his perspective, though, he has forgiven them. Unjustly from our perspective, but justly from his. And thus his forgiveness is far greater than anti, any antitype of the unjust steward. It's a lesser to greater as well. Because the unjust steward Jesus has forgiven not only 20% or 50% of your debts owed to him. In an act of utter worldly wastefulness or godly forgiveness, he's removed the entire wage of sin without any merit or worthiness at all. Balance owed? Take the sheet and write zero. <laughs> Merit needed? Nothing. Worthiness to work on? Zip. Thus, the injustice of our world, which could be commended in a way, is really the antitype, the opposite of God's mercy. The steward Jesus shows his mercy by squandering all of God's love and even his own life upon you. He's so reckless in his mercy that to our mortal eyes, we think him unjust, unfair. You want then to add to his mercy, you want to find some way to pay back a little portion of that treasury that he's already bestowed on you freely and fully. But that's not how it works. Grace is given when God forgives your trespasses freely. No merit or worth is needed. Mercy is shown to the sons of this world when the precious treasure of Jesus' blood is washed over you in holy baptism. And Jesus gave his life, his Father's dearest treasure, to gain for God a church, a body of believers, you, children of light, to dwell with him in his eternal home. Thus, Jesus is the unjust steward, at least to our earthly eyes. But thanks be to God that he is. So if you see someone in need, do you question their motives or do you give with abandon? If your neighbor needs your strength, do you consider the gain of wealth or do you offer generously? If you know your neighbor's unbelief, do you speak the truth in love or do you just leave that effort to someone else? Well, you probably do neglect to live the life that Jesus has given you to because you're still trying to have everything make sense to you in terms of logic, worldly wisdom. 
so, you do what is comfortable. You behave as your simple hearts want. You think about money, dollar signs, budgets, physical effort. That's theological, but that's not theologos, theology. Instead, Jesus would commend you today to be like him, to be like the people of this world who, in his terms, wisely squander and waste the possessions that he has given them for their master to gain friends. So you have been freed by Jesus to give recklessly and generously to win friends for, your, for you and for Jesus in heaven. That means that having been made children of light and having been bestowed unjustly with these gifts of forgiveness, Jesus would also have you learn something about your, our life together as Christians. Again, that final phrase, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, mammon, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. That explains what he means. You've been set free as Christians from worldly wisdom when it comes to the life that you're given to live. He changes your perspective. We talked about this in Bible study, the way that you look at home and church and even money. We don't think of it in terms like this world does. They're not treasures to store up. They're not to be wasted on ourselves, trying to get and to save or to, to make and to build is like grasping at the wind. The stuff of this life, including your life, is temporary, but redeemed, redeemed in order to be given to others. This we learn from Jesus, our unjust steward. Thanks be to God that the Son gave his life for us sinners, gave up his strength to make us strong, spoke the truth even when it cost him his own life. And he keeps pouring it out on us to point out that his overflowing mercy is so abundant that you can't even hold it all, but it overflows daily and richly into you and onto the life of your neighbors. I'm relieved that Jesus' stewardship, in Jesus' stewardship, in his budget, mercy wasn't a line item. Instead, we poor sinners, otherwise doomed to weakness and death, have received the seemingly unjust stewardship of the Father's wealth, Jesus himself. And it's not just for you, but it's for your friends also. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen.